Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention to the center stage. The performance is about to begin. Excitement, wonder, journeys, guilt, victimage, redemption. It's all here tonight, folks. Welcome to Module 13 on Dramatism. Our objectives are to define dramatism and explain key assumptions about how this language perspective is relevant and useful to rhetorical critics. Second, to formulate uh, a cycle of terms uh, and analyze how a guilt redemption framework can guide our critical analysis. And third, to interpret the elements of the pentad and apply the terms and relationships among the terms to assessing rhetorical artifacts. The working vocabulary is available to you, uh, as always. What is Kenneth Burke's dramatism, and what are some key assumptions? So we've heard from Burke about identification and about um, terministic screens and what goes with what in the mind of the writer. And in dramatism, we're looking at life and our uh, capacity as human beings, and we're asking the question, you know, how can we understand that? And he understands it by looking at it as drama uh, and using terms uh, for drama to understand how humans interact um, and what our motives are in, in many times and situations uh, that are complex. Um, so uh, it's the analysis of human motivation through the terms derived from the study of drama and uh, one of the assumptions is is that um, language is something that um, uh, is action. This body that I inhabit, it's motion, it's biological. But when we add my mind and my ability uh, to learn language and apply symbol, symbolic constructs um, and for my, um, for my body to learn language, when we add that capacity, um, then we're in the realm of action. And that's why to act, the base of action, um, forms the basis of the dramatism. The second is that humans uh, present and uh, develop messages the same way that, that a play is presented and rhetoric constitutes and presents a particular view of a situation. It's a way of sizing up a situation uh, and uh, um, naming its structure and naming its ingredients and how things are working. Symbolic action is um, Okay, so motion is the realm of the biological. Uh, animals, things move. And uh, Burke's perspective is that the whole universe, you know, moves uh, and that uh, in the jungle there are creatures and um, they all move. Uh, it's when humans come along with a symbolic capacity um, that we develop the capacity to, um, uh, um, the conditions for action are that we have um, freedom and we can choose. Uh, and, and, and so that gives us a kind of a symbolic capacity to make choices uh, and to have um, foreknowledge of the consequences of some of those choices. Um, second is to act with some um, purpose, which is to say I, I make choices um, and that that's a, a purpose. I decide um, in some way what's going to happen. Sometimes that's unconscious if I'm being burned. Um, sometimes it's conscious. Most of the time, um, my actions are my choices as I move through my day. Um, and third, condition for action is, of course, the motion, the biological capacity. Um, so we are bodies, motion, that learn language, action. Uh, and that's uh, Burke's perspective on that and the conditions. So is all the world a stage? Is that a metaphor? Um, no, not for Burke. That's actually the way it is. All the world is a stage um, and uh, we are symbol using animals and we experience our world as drama. Uh, and uh, our language analysis with cluster analysis and patatic analysis and the cycle of terms um, gives insight into our motives and the assumptions of the terministic screens and the perspectives that we have on the world. Interesting perspective, right? So, so let's start with the cycle of terms. Uh, the cycle of terms emerges from um, uh, his analysis of the first three books of uh, Genesis in the Bible. So if we find one of these terms somewhere, 
Burke's claim is, if you can see one of these terms, um, then you are likely to be able to find the other in some relationship. Uh, we'll explain it as a kind of a cycle, uh, but it's not a linear cycle. You can go from one to this one, um, to that one, and that one, and reveal them in different ways. Order is the, the established uh, set of rules. Uh, traffic laws, um, societies, uh, norms, um, uh, the uh, um, uh, various, uh, I, the, the, the idea uh, beginning, don't eat from the tree of knowledge, right? That's, that's the order. Uh, and then disorder, because um, disorder is always sort of implied in the idea of order because humans have the choice of action, right? Capital A-C-T, they can act. If you violate the order um, by um, imposing some disorder, you have committed then a sin against the order, uh, the violations of the order. For your sins, then, you are guilty and you feel and experience guilt in different ways. These are the personal and collective impacts of violating the order. Um, the, the guilt that weighs heavy on us or is used to manipulate us or doesn't seem to affect us at all in different ways, right? So, um, so what happens as a result of guilt then is victimage. We get um, uh, uh, scapegoating. We blame other people for our problems, right? Um, and this happened in Germany, um, you know, uh, before World War II. Uh, the economic situation was such that um, a group of people, the Jewish um, people, were blamed for the economic problems. Um, and that resulted um, in, a, you know, an effort of genocide and so forth. So, um, in, in some ways, um, there's some, some real power to the cycle of terms um, when we get into things like um, victimage and scapegoating and blaming others. The other approach to victimage is mortification. If you are mortified or embarrassed in some way, you <clears throat> punish yourself um, for um, uh, having violated the order, uh, and, and that ends up then um, in the, sort of the same kind of thing which is the final is, well, now that you've blamed and, uh, you know, removed or scapegoated um, uh, someone or you've punished yourself in response to the violation, uh, then, then re there's redemption. The, the order is then restored. Um, and we see that uh, in, in different, different situations. We've already seen the Hallmark ad um, where um, the, the, the brother is uh, embarrassing himself so bad and then of course he, um, he redeems himself by, by sort of mortifying himself and reading the Hallmark card. Uh, and, and, then, and then of course he's immediately back into it, right? Um, so um, that's, you know, that's an example of uh, a mortification and redemption. Um, I, I explained about hidden Hitler. Um, Tiger Woods' apology was um, mortification, uh, you know, trying to appease and, and, uh, and, and be, be sorry for having violated the order and the whole uh, domestic issue with him. Um, Bill Clinton's apology we watched uh, earlier, um, mortification and blame uh, in, uh, uh, on the investigation, right? So um, he mortifies himself, you know, says he regrets it and everything, but um, he then blames the uh, investigation for a lot of the problems um, that his family has experienced, right? To try and bring about and restore some, some sense of order. So, um, so interesting, interesting stuff. Um, there's a lot of different uh, options for investigating the cycle of terms, and they are powerful and do, do not always all have to be represented. Um, but, um, but, but, but I think that there, that's a framework, a dramatic framework, uh, that's kind of helpful sometimes to, to think about um, how um, humans interact uh, using um, the guilt redemption framework. So let's talk about the pentad. Uh, this is a bit of a different framework than the cycle of terms. We've got five terms, act, agent, agency, scene, purpose, and, uh, and we also have, um, uh, he added a sixth term, attitude. Um, we'll, we'll probably kind of put that with agent. Uh, agents have attitudes. Um, so, uh, 
So we'll just stick with the five, the pentad, for now. Let's talk a little bit about them. Each of them is associated with a, with a philosophical perspective. Uh, and uh, um, so I'm, I'm not going to go as much into that right now. Um, what I want to do is just kind of talk a little bit about how we understand them, both as a kind of an external framework and an internal framework for understanding like a, a, an artifact. Okay? So um, I'm giving a speech. Uh, that's an act. I'm the agent. I'm doing the speech. Uh, I'm using um, different kinds of things. I'm using a chart or a table uh, to uh, convey something to you via a play sheet. I'm using um, technology, a camera and lights and so forth. These are things that I am using to present this speech. Uh, I am here in my home. This is my scene. My purpose is to uh, educate you without sort of lecturing to you, just kind of going through some questions. All of that is true, but that's kind of the external framework. That's the journalistic who, what, where, how, why, right? Um, and, and so <clears throat> if that's not as interesting. Let's take an artifact. Let's take the speech and let's ask ourselves in that speech, um, Gettysburg Address, what are the ideas of a scene? Okay, so the speech is set at the Gettysburg, um, uh, but, but in the speech we get terms like the nation, the great civil war, um, we get our forefathers, um, and that kind of sets the historical scene. Um, so there's a lot of different scenic qualities within the speech itself. Same thing for agents, right? Um, the agent here is, is, is uh, Abraham Lincoln, but but within the speech, now, the agents are things like soldiers, a um, uh, big one is the people, uh, and, uh, um, and, there's, and there's other agents as well listed there. That's a, a part of a good exercise to go through that. Um, so, you know, the important thing here is that we look at the pentad um, in an external sense, but, but really what we need to focus on is within the artifact itself, how do these terms play out? All right, so what are some of the important principles? Well, first of all, um, is, uh, um, is the main focus is within the artifact, right? Which is what I was just explaining. Um, the artifact will have different examples that occur in different ways, agency and means, um, what is the purpose, uh, etc. The second um, uh, principle is that uh, we, we really address the important issues of what are the relationships among the terms and what is a dominant term for that particular situation. Um, so uh, so that, that becomes the focus. It, it isn't enough just to say, oh look, here's an act, here's an agent, here's an agency. What you, what you, for dramatic purposes, what you need to understand is well, what's, an, what's an important one? What's driving this particular situation? Um, and, and, and how are others related? What's the next most important one? So is the scene driving this whole action? You know, are we out in the middle of the ocean and the sharks are circling, right? Is, is that the important driving factor that leads to the agents, um, the characters um, developing or reacting in certain ways to the scene? Is that like a dominant ratio uh, for this artifact? All right. So the ratios are important because uh, they allow us to make comparisons between um, different elements and to identify um, which, which are important. So we can look at a statement like, when you're holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, and okay, so, so when, you're, when you're holding a hammer, that's a tool, that's a means, that's a way of doing something, that's agency. And when you're looking at the nail and you're saying, okay, when I'm holding this hammer, I'm going to hit that nail. That's an act, right? So the idea behind this saying um, is agency to act. That's the ratio. Only a heroic leader would have sacrificed his life for others. 
Ah, okay, so the admirable qualities of a person, an agent, lead to an unselfish action. Uh, again, we have agent to act ratio. Only when I'm on the road do I feel like I'm fulfilling my destiny. Well, being in a particular physical situation, a scene, um, delivers a sense of meaning in life, a purpose, okay? So um, you can do this kind of analysis in very specific ways, but then you can also look at an artifact, um, a speech or an, uh, an advertisement or something, and find important ratios that are explaining how, what's happening in this artifact. Um, and uh, um, there's uh, you know, a lot of different and interesting examples of, uh, of pentatic analysis. So uh, what's pentatic cartography? Uh, <clears throat> this is a situation where there's a more active use of the pentad. In other words, it's not just a kind of uh, map the possibilities, but, but also to talk about how does, do these possibilities set out either open up or limit our ability to, to discuss things, right? Um, so does, it, does the artifact open up the universe of discourse, the ability to tolerate other ideas, the interaction, um, stimulation of things, or does it tend to shut it down? Is it saying, you know, this is a more um, uh, uh, rigid or uh, linear perspective or um, limited in some way? Um, what happens then in cartography is that, well, now, if we, can, if we can map that, then we can map alternative routes, right? And, and that, that allows us to um, create counterstatements um, where you're actually articulating ratios and thinking about um, not only the ratios but the relationships between things to, to advocate counterstatements that can help open up the universe of discourse um, if, it's, uh, if it's being constricted or constrained in some ways. All right, and the question from the reading is about the dominant ratios that Gilmore finds in uh, Jiang's Hong Kong speech. Uh, what was surprising to this uh, set of ratios um, and what it wasn't to Gilmore? Post this. What is the most important ratio for George Mason University for you? Is it, is it an agency? Is it a means? Is it a, um, a scene? Uh, is it the people? Um, you know, what... What, uh, what ratio is most important for you? We have come, ladies and gentlemen, to the end of our show. Let us be grateful for the chance to enjoy ourselves, to be laughed at, to be entertained. And please, I hope you understand how important an understanding of dramatism might be for getting by in the world. Have a great day.